Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Mother Tongue, The Story of the English Language by Bill Bryson. So this is non-fiction, as always I'm going to read you the blurb, but then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Only Bill Bryson could make a book about the English language so entertaining. With his boundless enthusiasm and restless eye for the absurd, this is his astonishing tour of English. From its mongrel origins to its status as the world's most spoken tongue, its apparent simplicity to its deceptive complexity, its vibrant swearing to its uncertain spelling and pronunciation. Bryson covers all this as well as the many curious eccentricities that make it as maddening to learn as it is flexible to use. Bill Bryson's classic mother tongue is a highly readable and hilarious take of how English came to be the world's language. So, to the excerpts. So he says here, such is the demand to learn the language that there are now more students of English in China than there are people in the United States. And we get this uh, reference to active voice, which I was always taught active voice is good writing and passive voice is bad writing. And it says here, uh, a second, a second commonly cited factor setting English apart from other languages is its flexibility. This is particularly true of word ordering, where English speakers can roam with considerable freedom between passive and active senses. Not only can we say, I kicked the dog, but also, the dog was kicked by me. A construction that would be impossible in many other languages. And this was interesting, it says, In Cantonese, hey, means yes. But with a fractional change of pitch, it also describes the female pedenda. I hope I got the right one. And uh, to be bored to death in French is être de Birmingham, literally to be from Birmingham, which is actually about right. I'm from near Birmingham, so that made me chuckle. And uh, this was interesting too, it says, not only did various speech communities devise different languages, but also different cultural predispositions to go with them. Speakers from the Mediterranean region, for instance, like to put their faces very close, relatively speaking, to those they're addressing. A common scene when people from Southern Europe and Northern Europe are conversing, as at a cocktail party, is for the latter to spend the entire conversation stealthily retreating to try to gain some space, and for the former to keep advancing to close the gap. Neither speaker may even be aware of it. There are more of these speech conventions than you might suppose. English speakers dread silence. We are all familiar with the uncomfortable feeling that overcomes us when a conversation pauses. Studies have shown that when a pause reaches four seconds, one or more of the conversationalists will invariably blurt something, a fatuous comment on the weather, a startled cry of gosh, is that the time, rather than let the silence extend to a fifth second. So this is quite interesting. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm learning French, so I find anything French related interesting. And this is Canadian French, so. Even more bitter has been the situation in French-speaking Canada. In 1976, the separatist party Quebecois, under the leadership of René Levesque, introduced a law known as Bill 101, which banned languages other than French on commercial signs, restricted the number of admissions to English schools, and required the children of immigrants to be schooled in French, even if both parents spoke English, and made French the language of the workplace for any company employing more than 50 people. The laws were enforced by a committee with the ominous name of the Commission de Surveillance de la Langue Française, Fines of up to $760 were imposed by 400 language police. All of this was a trifle harsh on the 800,000 Quebec citizens who spoke English, and a source of considerable resentment, as when Merry Christmas greetings were ordered to be taken down, and 15,000 Dunkin' Donuts bags were seized. In December 1988, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that parts of Bill 101 were illegal. According to the court, Quebec could order that French be the primary language of commerce, but not the only one. As an immediate response, 15,000 francophones marched in protest through the streets of Montreal and many stores that had bilingual signs were vandalised, often by having the letters FLQ for Front de la Libération de Québec spray painted across their windows. One was firebombed. I didn't know this but uh, it interested me so it says uh, the nicknames Ned, Nell and Nan are thought to be corruptions of Mine Edward, Mine Ellen and Mine Anne. And there we go, didn't know that. And here we have a little bit about Shakespeare's influence on the language. No one in any tongue has ever made greater play of his language. He coined some 2,000 words, an astonishing number, and gave us countless phrases. As a phrase maker, there has never been anyone to match him. Among his inventions, one fell swoop in my mind's eye, more in sorrow than in anger, to be in a pickle, bag and baggage, vanish into thin air, budge an inch, play fast and loose, go down the primrose path, the milk of human kindness, remembrance of things past, the sound and the fury, to thine own self be true, 
To be or not to be, cold comfort, to beggar all description, salad days, flesh and blood, foul play, tower of strength, to be cruel to be kind, and on and on and on and on and on. He was so wildly prolific that he could put two in one sentence, as in Hamlet's observation. Though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. He could even mix metaphors and get away with it, as when he wrote, or to take arms against a sea of troubles. And manner there was spelled M-A-N-N-E-R, but I always thought it was to the manner born, as in like M-A-N-O-R, like a reference to riches. And this is quite funny as well. Um, that for, one, for a little while it seemed as though English was just going to stick to the island, you know. In 1582, the scholar Richard Mulcaster noted glumly, the English tongue is of small account, stretching no further than this island of ours, nay, not there overall. He had no way of knowing that within less than a generation, English would be transported to the new world, where it would begin its inexorable rise to becoming the foremost language of the world. Uh, this, I found this interesting because my boss at the art centre is called Ruth. Many of these words did once have positive forms, Ruthless was companioned by Ruth, meaning compassion. One of Milton's poems contains the well-known line, Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with Ruth. So then he looks at how words are created, and he, he says, uh, Words are created by error. One sort is called ghost words. The most famous of these, perhaps, is Dord, which appeared in the 1934 Merriam-Webster International Dictionary as another word for density. In fact, it was a misreading of the scribble D or D, meaning that density could be abbreviated either to a capital or lowercase letter. The people in Merriam-Webster quickly removed it, but not before it found its way into other dictionaries. Such occurrences are more common than you might suppose. According to the first supplement of the OED, there are at least 350 words in English dictionaries that owe their existence to typographical errors or other misrenderings. For the most part, they are fairly obscure. One such is massage, a legal term to describe a house, its land and buildings. It is thought to be simply a careless transcription of the French menage. And uh, this is great. Finally, erroneous words are sometimes introduced by respected users of the language who simply make a mistake. Shakespeare thought illustrious was the opposite of lustrous and thus for a time gave it a sense that wasn't called for. Rather more alarmingly, the poet Robert Browning caused considerable consternation by including the word twat in one of his poems, thinking it an innocent term. The work was Pippa Passes, written in 1841, and now remembered for the line, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. But it also contains this disconcerting passage. Then owls and bats, cows and twats, monks and nuns in a cloister's moods adjourned to the oak stump pantry. And apparently nobody ever corrected him because they were too embarrassed. I thought this was cool as well. Sometimes words are made up for a specific purpose. The US Army in 1974 devised a food called Funestrada as a test word during a survey of soldiers' dietary preferences. Although no such food existed, Funestrada ranked higher in the survey than lima beans and eggplants, which seems about right to me, at least as far as the lima beans go. And obviously I always enjoy spotting uh, ejaculations, and uh, we have a reference to that here. Sometimes the changing connotations of a word can give a new and startling sense to literary passages, as in The Mayor of Casterbridge, where Thomas Hardy, as one of his characters, gazed upon the unattractive exterior of Farfrae's erection, or in Bleak House, where Dickens writes that Sir Lester leans back in his chair and breathlessly ejaculates. We get this, which I kind of disagree with there. It says, the amount of slurring depends on the degree of familiarity and frequency with which the word is spoken. The process is well illustrated by the street in London called Marlebone Road. Visitors from abroad often misread it as Marleybone. Provincial Britons tend to give it its full phonetic value, Mary Lebone. Londoners are inclined to slur it to Marebone or something similar, while those who live or work along it slur it even further to something not far off Mum. No, everyone calls it Marleybone, at least where I live. It says here, it is for the same reason precisely that in modern England it is considered more refined to pronounce eight as et. No, I would say again that's the other way round. Et is considered like quite vulgar and uncouth and like uneducated. And then this is interesting because I pronounce the words properly according to this, so it says, but without doubt the most remarkable example of pronunciation change arising purely as a whim of fashion was the sudden tendency in 18th century upper class southern England to pronounce words like dance, bath and castle with a broad A as if they were spelled dance, bath and castle. In the normal course of things we might have expected the pronunciations to drift back but for some reason they stuck, at least they have so far, helping to underscore the social, cultural and orthopaic differences between not only Britons and Americans, but even Brit between Britons and Britons. The change was so consequential and far-reaching that it's not so much a matter of pronunciation as of dialect. Um, and yeah, like, people can tell that I'm from, at least from the north of, like, the home counties here in the UK, because I say Bath instead of Bath. Uh, we get a reference to Australian English, they have this great uh, phrase, technicolor yawn for throwing up. 
and it says, and then of course there are all those incomparable Australian expressions, scarce as rocking horse manure, about as welcome as a turd in a swimming pool, don't come the raw prawn, which means don't try to fool me, and rattle your dags, forget a move on. And this is just a really fascinating kind of comparison between English and Chinese. To appreciate the wonderfully simplifying beauty of this system, you have only to look at the problems that bedevil the Chinese and Japanese languages. There are two ways of rendering speech into writing. One is with an alphabet, such as we have, and the other is with a pictographic ideographic system, such as the Chinese use. The basic unit of the Chinese written word is the radical. The radical for earth is, and for small is, I, I can't really show you those. All words in Chinese are formed from these and 212 other radicals. Radicals can stand alone or be combined to form other words. Eye and water make teardrop, mouth and bird make song, two women means quarrel, and three women means gossip. <laughs> this quote from George Bernard Shaw here, here he says, An intelligent child who is bidden to spell debt, and very properly spells it D-E-T, is caned for not spelling it with a B, because Julius Caesar spelled it with a B. And this is probably my favourite little uh, story of the whole thing. Perhaps for our last words on the subject of usage, we should turn to the last words of the venerable French grammarian, Dominique Bonheur, who proved on his deathbed that a grammarian's work is never done, when he gazed at those gathered loyally around him and whispered, I am about to, or I am going to, die. Either expression is used. And here we uh, get a little bit about the dictionary, and this is just like one of those kind of characters, uh, you know, history is full of these, these sort of crazy characters. I, I say crazy quite literally here. But an even more prolific contributor was an American expatriate named Dr. W.C. Minor, a man of immense erudition who provided from his private library the etymologies of tens of thousands of words. When Murray invited him to a gathering of the dictionary's contributors, he learned, to his considerable surprise, that Dr. Minor could not attend for the unfortunate reason that he was an inmate at Broadmoor, a hospital for the criminally insane, and not sufficiently in possession of his faculties to be allowed out. It appears that during the US Civil War, having suffered an attack of sunstroke, Dr. Minor developed a persecution mania, believing he was being pursued by Irishmen. After a stay in an asylum, he was considered cured and undertook in 1871 a visit to England. But one night while walking in London, his mania returned and he shot dead an innocent stranger whose misfortune it was to have been walking behind the crazed American. Clearly, Dr. Minor's madness was not incompatible with scholarship. In one year alone, he made 12,000 contributions to the OED from the private library he built up at Broadmoor. And I'm going to attempt to pronounce this. This is um, moving on to the new world and uh, words being taken from um, American Indians, uh, you know, Native Americans. In Massachusetts, there was a lake that the Indians called Chagoga Manchawaga Go Chaobanu Gonga Mao, which is said to translate as you fish on that side, we'll fish on this side, and nobody will fish in the middle. Good name. So uh, I learned that um, before this guy, Logan Pearsall Smith, an American living in England, before he came along, uh, we didn't call them roundabouts, we called them gyratory circuses. And I thought this was cool. I don't know if this is still the case because AI has come a long way since, like, you know, even in the last five years, but um, it was talking about, well, let me just read the full paragraph here. Um, Computers, with their lack of passion and admirable ability to process great streams of information, would seem to be ideal for performing translations, but in fact they are pretty hopeless at it, largely on account of their inability to come to terms with idiom, irony, and other quirks of language. An oft-cited example is the computer that was instructed to translate the expression out of sight, out of mind, out of English, and back in again, and came up with blind insanity. It is curious to reflect that we have computers that can effortlessly compute pi to 5,000 places and yet cannot be made to understand that there is a difference between time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana. Or that in the English speaking world, to make up a story, to make up one's face and to make up after a fight are all quite separate things. Here at last, Esperanto may be about to come into its own. A Dutch computer company is using Esperanto as a bridge language in an effort to build a workable translating system. The idea is that rather than, say, translate Danish directly into Dutch, the computer would first translate it into Esperanto, which could be used to smooth out any difficulties of syntax or idiom. Esperanto would in effect act as a kind of air filter, removing linguistic impurities and idiomatic specs that would clog the system. Another thing I would disagree with here, it says, a remarkable example of this is bloody in England, which to most Britons is at least as objectionable a word as shit, and yet it is meaningless. No, disagree with that. If I said shit, my mum would have killed me. If I said bloody, she would have thought it was funny. And uh, this is a funny little uh, story here. 
Almost a century before Queen Victoria reigned, Samuel Johnson was congratulated by a woman for leaving indecent words out of his dictionary, to which he devastatingly replied, so you've been looking for them, have you, madam? And uh, I love this as well, last thing I want to read out. Uh, Verbal japes of one type or another have been a feature of English literature ever since. Shakespeare so loved puns that he put 3,000 of them, that's right, 3,000, into his plays, even to the extent of exerting them in the most seemingly inappropriate places, as when in King Henry IV Part I, the father of Hotspur learns of his son's tragic death and remarks that Hotspur is now Cold Spur. Amazing. So yeah, overall Mother Tongue by Bill Bryson, fascinating little read. If you're into language, you're going to enjoy this one. I gave this one a 4 out of 5 and would heartily recommend it. Don't really have much more to say to that. Uh, I think the excerpts speak for themselves for this one. So there we have it, that's what I made of Mother Tongue by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.